13 through uh, 34. Father, we're going to come before you right now, God. Lord, we want to invite your presence here. Lord, that we know that by inviting your presence here, we know we invite you here. Father God, because we know you're real. And so, Lord, I just ask that right now, that as we begin this service, that uh, you would just come, that you'd speak to us, that we wouldn't miss you. We wouldn't miss your presence. We wouldn't miss your voice. We wouldn't miss your loving heart for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We started this study in John, I think uh, we're on our fourth week, maybe we're on our fifth week. And the book of John was written by um, the Apostle John, and it is a testimony. The whole book, is a, it's a testimony. It's John trying to say, hey, I found Jesus, I know Jesus, you need to know him too. It, it, it's, it's the equivalent of, of somebody just wanting to share what they know. I don't know if you've ever shared your testimony with somebody or if you've shared something you know, but John is that book. And John 19 is the testimony of, of, of Jesus and who he is and of John the Baptist. And if you have your Bibles, you can flip over there. It reads like this. It says, and this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then are you, Elijah? He said, no, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. I'm going to pause for just a second. Because you see, there's this dynamic that's going on here that, that we look at like there might be just this conversation that's going on. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, they're related. If you go back and you read Matthew's account of John the Baptist, and, and when, when he was in the womb, that he recognized who God was in the womb, is, is the way Matthew tells it. There's this, there's this idea that John the Baptist, when nobody else recognized Jesus, he did. Maybe you had that situation. Maybe when you recognized Jesus, none of your other friends did. Maybe there was this thing that went on for you. Maybe you were introduced to Christ by a friend. But John the Baptist was the one who recognized Jesus first. And so he says, I'm the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the pathways. Here's what's really important in this. You see, they recognized there was something different about John the Baptist besides the fact that he was eating locusts. That in itself, you know there's something different about that person. And honey... And they recognized there was something different about John. And so they began to prod him because where John recognized Jesus, the Levites and the priests recognized that this should be the time when Jesus should come on the scene. They were looking for him. And so they began to ask him if he was the Messiah. And the reason that they asked him if he was the Messiah wasn't because they really wanted to know him. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody that didn't really want to know Jesus? but they were asking just weird questions. That's what's going on at this point. And the reason that they're asking these questions is because if John says that he's the Messiah, then he is the perfect guy to kill. Because anybody claiming to be the Messiah, they thought was crazy. And so they were trying to set him up. And that's why they're asking, who are you? And now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Verse 34. 
Verse 29. And the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If you have your Bibles, underline that right now. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Actually, I want to pause for just a second. If you have a bulletin, I want you to take out right now in your bulletin, there's a newcomer's card that we set in there. If I would have thought about it, I would have set a different card in there. But there's a newcomer's card in your bulletin that gives a, a blank spot for you to write out prayer requests and, 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 and tell us what you thought of the service. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If you were going to get rid of something tonight in the area of sin, what would it be? If, if tonight you came to church and you were to say, you know what, God, I would really like for you to do this in my life, what would it be? And during the service sometime tonight, I want you to just write it on that newcomer's card, all right? So he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is the one who baptized, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. You see, what, what I know to be true about the Bible is this. There's two things that run through the Bible. The first thing that runs through the Bible, and it runs from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, is this. God is good. Right? Isn't that the story of the Bible? Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, the story is God is good, God is real, and God is loving. The other thing that runs through the Bible runs from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 22. Man is broken, and we need God. And so, because man is broken and we need God, there's a sense that happens in every human being, every man, every woman, every child, there is this longing to know and have relationship with God. And so for generation after generation after generation, in all generations, people are looking to have relationship with God. They're looking for God. Can you imagine being the one who goes, that's the Messiah. That's the best. Can you imagine being John? That's the Messiah. You see, and there was this theme that happened for people in this day, and one of the themes was this. When John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he has already, he has already created this image that people recognize about the Lamb of God. Because the Lamb of God was the sacrificial lamb. And so if you're taking notes, the very first thing that I want you to write down is just simply this. Jesus Christ came as our sacrifice. This is the story that John is trying to convey. That Jesus Christ, he came as our sacrifice. You see, when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. The Jews were very familiar with the Lamb of God. Every morning and every evening, the Jews would hear the bells sound, and the sound of those bells told everybody that a lamb had been sacrificed for their sins. And this happened every day. In Jewish culture, this was so common that children knew about it. Children would ask their parents, hey, Dad, what's the bells? And the dad would say, son, Every morning and every evening, the church, they sacrifice a lamb. And you see that that lamb represents the sins that you and I are going to commit today. That lamb um, represents the sins that we commit and that, that as a command from God, because you and I do not have the ability to cover those sins, God's commanded us to sacrifice a lamb that there would be blood spilt. 
Exodus 29, 38. You see, the other thing that this represents to the Jewish community is this. Every time that they hear those bells, it takes them back to the time when they were under the oppression of King Herod, or of, of, when they were under the oppression of King Herod. And that, that God came along and said, here's the plan, here's what I want you to do. Every Jewish family, I want you to sacrifice a lamb tonight. I want you to put the blood up on your doorstep. And tonight the dark angel is going to come through. And every family that has blood on the posts, that they will not be hurt. And every family that doesn't, then their first and oldest son will be taken from them. And as the Jews remembered this, the one thing that they went back to was that God spared them. That God was blessing them. And what they remembered and what they knew was that Jesus is our Passover. His blood saves us. Romans 3, 21 through 26, if you have your Bibles, you can flip over there. It says, but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glorious, glorious standards of God and are justified freely by grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. You see, here's what John was trying to convey. That John was trying to convey that Jesus came to take away our sins. And I think in America today, we sit in church and go, oh, yeah, Jesus takes away our sins. I love Jesus. Jesus, forgive me. He takes away our sins, Right? But like, like, like there's, this, there's this head knowledge. But the heart knowledge is a long way from understanding what the head comprehends. When John was saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I want you to get this. He wasn't saying that Jesus takes away the sins of the world as a metaphor. This wasn't an idea of a metaphor. This wasn't an idea of, hey, let me kind of give you this image. That like when you struggle, if you ask Jesus to take away the sins that are going on in your life, then metaphorically, that happens. And don't you feel good? This, this wasn't a metaphor. Jesus was literally saying, he takes away sin. Come here. I need an example. I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. Do you see how I waited for hands to go up? I want you to get this. Okay. You're Jesus. Does that feel good? Just stand there and look like Jesus. Does he got it going on? Yeah, you're Jesus. Yeah. 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 That when Jesus takes away sin, when you and I come to Christ and we say, you know what, God? And maybe, maybe for you it's a, it's a down on your knees kind of thing and you're saying, you know what, God, man? I'm really struggling. Lord, you know the stuff I'm struggling with. You know the stuff that's in my mind that shouldn't be in my mind. You know the stuff that's in my heart that shouldn't be in my heart. But God, I need you to take it. You know what Jesus does? He takes it. Here, here's why this is so important. This is not a metaphor. He takes it. And you can't take it back. Okay? Thank you, Brian. Give Brian a hand. So you've got to understand this. This is really important to understand. Because John starts off, and he's, he's telling you about the word of God. The Word. 
And, and as he's going through John chapter 1, he's trying to convey this idea that Jesus is God and he is real. And if Jesus is God and he is real, then that means this. Sin is not a metaphor for anything. Sin is real. All right. We know that sinful actions, we know that we have actions and that we call these things sin, right? Have you ever done anything sinful? All right, maybe 12 of us. Everybody else is going to pray for us 12 after service. That, that we know that we have actions, and the actions that don't honor God, we call sin. And in those actions that don't honor God that we call sin, sometimes we think of them because we can't actually see the effect that it has upon God. That we maybe think that maybe me praying is a metaphor for something. You see, here's what I believe. I believe that not only was John saying that Jesus is God and he's real, that God's real, but I believe that when he says that he takes away the sin of the world, I believe he's talking about something physical. I believe that he's talking about a spiritual connection that, that, that I don't know about you, but when I gave my life to Christ and I confessed my sin, like, I mean, like, when I was sitting in my Volkswagen bug in 1985, a bunch of you are like, dude, I wasn't even born in 1985. <laughs> All right. When I was sitting in my Volkswagen bug in 1985, a convertible on a spring day, and I gave my life to Christ, I'm telling you that I don't know what happened, but my heart was heavy, and then it was light. Did you experience that? How many of you guys have experienced that? That at some point in time, you had something that was going on in your life. And you said, you know what, God, I need you to intervene. That I need you to forgive me. I need you to take this thing from me. I need to give that to you. And you're confessing sin. And all of a sudden, your heart's heavy, and then your heart's light. You see, I don't believe that sin is a metaphor for anything. I believe it's physical. I believe it's real. And that John is coming along and he's saying two things. First, Jesus is real. He's alive. When you pray to Jesus, you're not praying to the ceiling. Sometimes you feel like you do, right? When you pray to Christ, you're not praying to someone who doesn't hear you. He's real. And when you give Christ, when you give the stuff in your life over to him, he takes it. It's a real thing. You see, that just as Jesus takes away the sins of the world, it just means that he takes away my sins. He takes away the stuff that I've confessed. Just as Nate was asking the question, does, does the sacrifice of an animal, does the sacrifice... Of a, of a goat or a sheep? Does it really have the power to take away my sins? Because you see, up until Christ, and God had commissioned it, but up until Christ, the way that a person got rid of their stuff was to sacrifice an animal. Like, you didn't pay for it. The animal paid for it. And literally, families would come around, a, a sheep that they had set aside, and they would lay their hands upon the sheep and they would confess their wrongs. And then dad would take that sheep and he would set it up on an altar. And he would kill it. And, and the reason for that is because God wanted to set a standard that said, you need to understand that your sins have effect upon our relationship. Meaning our relationship from me to God. And that, that you don't pay for those sacrifices Blood is taken for those sacrifices. And he was setting this up for century after century after century until Christ came so that when Jesus came on the scene that people would understand that there is the one who takes away the sins of the world. And here's why this is really important. Is that Jesus came to take away our sins. 
And if you have confessed Christ, when we crucify ourselves, we devalue the sacrificial crucifixion of Jesus. Do you know that? Like, like the enemy has this way of, you've given your life to Jesus, but he will continue to beat you up over the things of your past. Right? And that not only will he continue to beat you up over the things of your past, that as a matter of fact, he doesn't just beat you up. You join in, and as he's crucifying you, you start crucifying yourself. That, that, whole, that whole thing of, oh, I'm so terrible. Why would God ever love me? You see, and here's the good part, is that you don't have it in you. You can't feel bad enough. Like for the things that happen in your life, there is not a point at which you can ever feel bad enough. Like me feeling bad enough will never way, ever take away my wrongs. Right? Like, like you go, oh, I, I feel so terrible. You can't beat yourself up enough. You can't bleed enough. You can't pay enough penance. I was in Mexico many years ago. I was teaching at this church. It was interesting because I was teaching at this Catholic church. I've never been Catholic a day in my life. As a matter of fact, up till this point, I had only been in one other Catholic church. And as I'm preaching, and there's the place is packed, not because I'm preaching, but because like when people come to share God's word, at this particular church, man, they just packed it out. I'm guessing there's four, five, six hundred people there, which was a lot for a Catholic service. And as I'm preaching, all of a sudden, this woman comes down the middle aisle on her hands and knees in the middle of the service. And there's blood everywhere. That she had crawled to the church for three quarters of a mile on her hands and knees every few steps stopping to pray and to pray. And so as I'm preaching, I see this, and I keep going, and at the end of service, I grab one of the guys, I'm like, hey, do we need to do something about this? I said, oh, no, 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 no. This is how she sacrifices. That, that what she does is she, she prays for a mile on her hands and knees until she's bloody, until she gets to the altar, and her blood's everywhere. And it's her way of sacrificing so that God will forgive her. And I walked away from that. And, and you need to know, we probably need, in our churches in America, maybe a little stronger commitment in many areas. This was sweet to God. And at the same time, I think just like this woman, so many of us have not captured the idea that God came to be our sacrifice. That, that God is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And if he takes away the sins of the world, then he takes away your sins. That, 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 that Jesus coming to die on the cross was not a metaphor for anybody. It was real. It was the action. That because Jesus' blood was spilt, we no longer have to sacrifice with sheep and goats. Because Jesus' blood was spilt, we can give him the sin that, that takes over our life. And when we give that to him, it's gone. It's real. See, I think here's the other thing that happens. is just as Jesus takes away the sins of the world, that when Jesus takes away the sins of the world, you know what else he takes away? He takes away the power of the sin. He takes away the power of sin. My father didn't give his life to Christ until he was 38 years of age. I'm 39 this year. 
So he was about the same age that I was when he gave his life to Christ. And on the day that he gave his life to Christ, Jesus took away the power of filthy language. He was a guy who, who struggled with his language, that, that worked on the oil rigs, and, and that, that his, his struggle was, I mean, like he had a real hard time. He cussed all the time. And when he gave his life to Christ, he said, I no longer want this to happen. And on that day, I've never heard my dad say a bad word. He took away alcoholism. That on the day that he gave his life to Christ, my father was an alcoholic. And at the moment that he gave his life to Christ, he's never touched alcohol. 38 years later. On the day that he gave his life to Christ, God took away a smoking addiction that he had had since he was probably 14. Because when Jesus takes away sin, he takes away the power of sin. He takes away the condemnation of sin. Romans 3.23 and 3.24 says, There is no difference for all of sin and all fall short of the glorious standards of God and are justified freely by the grace through, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. He's just simply saying, no matter who we are or what we've done, God has the ability to to take away the power of sin in your life. And the other thing that he does when he takes away the power of sin is he takes away the guilt of sin. He takes away the guilt of sin. He takes away, he takes, that the, sin has two powers over people. One, it has the power of the control of the life. That you, you're trying to break an addiction. You're trying to break a habit. A habit that's not honoring to God. How many of you have had those? Or have had those? We all have those, right? We all have areas in our life where we say, you know what, God? Man, if I, could take, if I could have you take away one thing, it would be this. And maybe you wrote it down on that card. And what comes along with that addiction or that, that struggle is guilt, right? That every time you cross that line, every time you go that, to that place that you don't want to go, doesn't the enemy beat you up? You see, here's the part about the enemy. We have a way quiet crowd tonight. The part about the enemy is this. He gets you coming and going, doesn't he? He gets you coming in the sense that he says, you know you want to do that. No, no, I know I want to do it, but I know I shouldn't do it. You guys have those moments? Like the light is yellow. And then there's a moment, the light's yellow, and you're like, no, no, I, I know I shouldn't do this. I'm going. And not that that's sin, running yellow lights. Because if that's sin, we're all in trouble. Can you imagine standing behind the guy who runs yellow lights, and you get to heaven, and God says, you're not in. He says, what? I'm not in? Yeah, no, you ran too many yellow lights. I would just be going, oh, no, go, go ahead of me. <laughs> hey, school, hey, no, you go ahead of me, too. It's good. Anybody else want to go ahead of me? But we all have these things, right? And the enemy always draws us in. And then after he draws us in, what happens? I can't believe you did that. I can't believe. You shouldn't have ran that yellow light. You are going to hell for sure. Or how about that, that thing? I can't believe you did that. You should, probably should tell your mother. I am not telling my mother. I'll tell God, but I'm not telling my mom. You know? And there's this side that comes. And so when it says that Jesus takes away, behold the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. When he takes away your sin... He really takes it. He takes away the power of sin that is controlling you. He takes away the guilt of sin. That, that, that this is, um, he takes away the guilt of sin. That the thing that you've done in the past, you don't have to be ashamed of that. As a matter of fact, the glory of God is that I can stand up here and I can share my past with you. Do you know why? 
Because it's my past, it's not my present. It's my past, it's not my future. And do you know why it's my past and not my present or not my future? Because God took it from me. And when he took it from me, he really took it from me. I think one of the uh, most interesting things I've read lately, I'm taking a class on Paul and the Pauline literature. So I'm taking a class um, from CCU. And I never understood this. I never knew this. But the very first church that Paul pastored was the church of Antioch. The church of Antioch came from a group of believers who was persecuted by this man and this man killed their pastor. His name was Stephen. And the man who killed Stephen was Paul. Was Saul. The man who killed Stephen, who had Stephen killed, was Saul. And after he was killed, this group of believers, they freaked out. They ran, and they went to Antioch, and they started a church there. And they didn't have a pastor. And it was shortly after that that, that Paul, Saul, encountered Christ. Because Christ is real, and Christ changed his life, and he gave his heart, soul, and mind to Jesus. And Jesus sent him to preach. And he became a pastor. And he became their pastor. Why? Because he had a past. But when he met Jesus, his past stayed in the past. And his past was no longer his present or his past was no longer his future because Jesus took the sands of Paul. He took them. He changed his life. For all of sin. And while I may have guilt and regrets about my past, I don't have to live with that shame. Because I get to use that as a testimony for what God's done in my life. Hebrews 10, 1 through 7, was the reference that Nate referred to in the entry, the opening video. It says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow. It was a dim preview of the good things to come. Not the good things themselves. The sacrifice under the systems were repeated again and again, year after year. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the the, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once for all time. And their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why, when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings, Or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. You see what Hebrews is trying to connect? The writers of Hebrews is this. Is that here's how you and I connect to God. That when we connect to God, we repent for our sins. Which is an acknowledgement that Jesus is real. And that Jesus is God. And then we turn from it. You see, here's our sacrifice. Our sacrifice isn't that we have to cut ourselves. Our sacrifice isn't that we have to crawl to the altar on our our hands and knees until we have bloody stubs. Our sacrifice is that when we commit to Christ and ask for forgiveness, that we turn from our sin and we stop doing it. That we trust God to be God. Our act of sacrifice is to repent from our sins and turn from them. Our act of sacrifice is not to let sin control our lives. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. And we're going to close with our last worship song, just like we normally do. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that piece of paper that's in your bulletin or another piece of paper 
And I really want you to write it out. Write out what you want God to do in your life. Write out what you need to give him. That praying and asking Christ to take the sin that you struggle with isn't a metaphor. You ask, he takes it. Amen? It's real. You ask, he takes it because sin is real. You ask, he takes it because Jesus is real. This is what John's trying to get us to understand. That the book of John is a testimony. It's a testimony of Jesus, God, coming to the earth as a living sacrifice to pay the price that you and I, we do not have the ability to pay. You see, here's the, here's the issue. The issue is this. You and I have two choices. We either let Christ pay or we pay. It would be the equivalent if afterwards, which we're going to do, we invite you all to go to Starbucks. And we say, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay for you to go to Starbucks. And you show up to Starbucks, and you know that we're paying. But then you go to the counter, and you order your drink, and you say, no, 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 I want to pay. And we say, no, we're paying. No, 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 I'm not letting you pay. I'm paying. So we stand back and go, all right, you want to pay? You can pay. You see, so many of us do that with our relationship with Christ. Christ sacrificed. He gave his life. He says, I paid the price. And you say, no, I don't want you to pay my price. And he says, no, I, pa I paid the price. No, I'll pay my own price. The difference is, you paying doesn't have the ability to overcome anything. Because our sacrifice is worth nothing. Because our past is lousy. We haven't been able to overcome sin in the past. Which tells me that I won't be able to overcome sin in the future on my own. The only way that we overcome our past is from laying that upon Christ. So that's my challenge to you during this last song. Whatever you're struggling with, write it out. Put it on a piece of paper. After service, come put it on the front. Just come put it up here. Won't read them, won't look over them. But you need to know that what you do tonight is not a metaphor for anything. You really do give your life to Christ. You really do give your sin stuff to Christ, and he takes it. Amen?
God would be saying, you know what? Paul, why don't you come to me? Why don't you give your life to me? And I would sit there and I'd say, no, I'm not going to. I'm not ready to.